Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here and it's fun to get to speak about music in a music venue. <laughs> it's not very often that happens. Um, so today's topic, music and politics, the Cold War. As a way to think about the interaction between music and politics, I want to talk to you today about the role that music played in the Cold War. And of course, the Cold War was a very strange and unique kind of war, as you all know. It lasted for, for four decades. Um, it brought about uh, not only a cold conflict, but also many hot conflicts in uh, countries like um, Korea and Vietnam, as you see in these pictures. Um, but thanks to the nuclear ca capacities of the two superpowers, as again, I'm sure you know, um, the, the two superpowers never actually fought each other directly. So there never was the terrible nuclear Armageddon that so many people feared. And what this meant was that really the only consistent feature of the Cold War was the ideological conflict between these two countries, the ideological conflict between democratic capitalism and communism. And in the context of this enduring ideological conflict, the arts became particularly significant. Um, their, their import really plays out in two quite distinct ways. Firstly, they became important as sites in which shared anxieties could be explored. So we can think, for example, of uh, folk music, which, of course, during the Cold War became a particularly popular venue uh, for protest music. Um, we can also think of country music, um, which became more a vehicle for the political right um, with uh, pro-war songs. Um, so those are just two examples of uh, musical styles that explored political issues during the Cold War providing a way for um, um, people in the United States specifically to, uh, to explore their feelings about this complicated and new kind of conflict. But what I want to talk about today is another way in which the Cold War affected music. And that was in the use of music as a tool for government. This will be the topic of my talk today. Now, the United States, who will be the focus of my talk today, was certainly not the only country to use music as a political tool during the Cold War. Many countries realized that there was um, a potential political power in this seemingly innocuous artistic medium. And here's a couple of examples. Um, both the Soviet Union and China, on the other side, as it were, um, both sent their own great uh, musical institutions, musical and um, uh, dance institutions, overseas during this period to promote uh, what they saw as um, the uh, artistic um, sophistication and greatness that was possible under the communist system. Um, but today, as I say, I'm going to be focusing on what happened on this side of the pond, and particularly, uh, specifically in the United States. So how and why did the United States government decide that music could possibly help them to win the Cold War? Who on earth came up with this strange idea? As it turns out, Eisenhower was a key force in um, bringing about uh, musical diplomacy, as I refer to it. And um, a couple of summers ago, I went down to the Eisenhower Library down in Kansas, where he's from, and um, I looked through his papers to try to find um, evidence um, of his motivations for um, setting up this program. And indeed, the program that he set up that um, sent musicians overseas was a program that was funded with his own emergency fund. So it was something he clearly felt very strongly about. So I thought, well, why? Why did he feel strongly about it? And I found there various documents that I think are quite revealing in terms of, uh, in terms of his motivations. Um, this first uh, document is a uh, memo. Um, no, sorry, it's not a memo. It's a press release that um, was released by the White House, um, which uh, was intended to demonstrate their reasons for establishing this program. So if you will, this is kind of the, pub the public front um, that, of, of what the program is all about. It helped to explain the program to American citizens. And I'm just realizing I actually want to read this off the screen for you. 
and I can't really turn around and have you hear me, so I'm just going to be a pop star for a minute and do this. <laughs> okay, so in this press release, um, it says, the president believes that such a program, if carried out in good faith and with true reciprocity, may now contribute to the better understanding of the peoples of the world that must be the foundation for peace. So with this press release, um, the White House is arguing that music is this wonderful vehicle to help people to understand each other and thereby to create peace. So a very um, utopian vision of music's possibilities for sure. This next document, however, the next two documents I'm going to show you, are somewhat different. And both of them were, um, were uh, correspondences uh, that were not um, intended for the outside world. So perhaps they may enable us to get a better sense of you know, what might be really going on here. So this second one, uh, which is a memo, it's a memo from the president to the Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles. He says in this memo, I do believe that they treat the term psychological warfare in too narrow a fashion. After all, psychological warfare can be anything from the singing of a beautiful hymn up to the most extraordinary kind of physical sabotage. So this demonstrates that Eisenhower believed that the singing of a beautiful hymn could serve as psychological warfare. He goes into a bit more detail in this letter to his brother, Edgar. Um, Edgar had asked him, why, why does the US, why, why are you doing this? Why are you sending these musicians overseas? This seems like a very strange thing to be doing. And he said, to the matter of using musicians in our propaganda work abroad, it's possible that you do not understand how ignorant most of the world is about America and how important it is to us that some of the misunderstandings be corrected. One of them involves our cultural standards and our artistic tastes. Europeans have been taught that we are a race of materialists whose only diversions are golf, <laughs> baseball, football, horse racing, and an especially brutalized brand of boxing. Our successes are described in terms of automobiles and not in terms of worthwhile cultural works of any kind. Spiritual and intellectual values are deemed to be almost non-existent in our country. He goes on, this picture of their misunderstanding is not overdrawn. In fact, in some areas, we are believed to be bombastic, jingoistic, and totally devoted to the theories of force and power as the only worthwhile elements in the world. And he goes down later on, one of the ways to fix this is to send music and art and drama overseas. So there's sort of several different things going on here. He's saying that, um, that there's this image that foreigners have of America, that all that they can create under this democratic capitalist system is cars and movies and uh, trivial cultural products and um, you know, the great products that are um, sent throughout the world that aren't cultural. Um, and that unfortunately they are also only really interested in taking over the world. <laughs> Now this, of course, contrasted very starkly with the Soviet Union, uh, where the US government was very much involved in funding the arts. Um, all composers um, who were members of the Composers' Union received money from government to be composers. Um, if that was promoted a certain way, it certainly looked a hell of a lot better than what was happening in the United States, where the government weren't at all involved in the arts and had never been traditionally. So he's saying, we've got to fix this. We've got to get, give people a sense um, that the United States isn't just about pop music and movies and making cars and fridges. We can do high culture too. So today, I want us to look at three different ways in which um, this interest on the part of the US government in the early Cold War influenced music. And I'm going to look at three different uh, programs within government that involved music. The first uh, such program is perhaps the one that's best known. Uh, the State Department, um, during the 50s and 60s, organized tours of performing musicians um, across the globe. And I'm going to be looking at a couple of those tours um, and thinking about their, their importance in the Cold War. I'm also going to be talking about the CIA, which, as we will see, was secretly involved in funding a number of uh, cultural projects during this period. In many ways, this is perhaps even more intriguing than the State Department's overt funding of the arts. 
And finally, I want to talk to you about the US Information Agency, um, which was a kind of propaganda agency um, which was created to uh, promote um, the United States and its values through informational materials. So let's start with the New York Philharmonic. I thought I would tell you today a little bit about this tour, the tour they did of Europe and the Soviet Union in 1959. I think it is um, a, a particularly intriguing uh, State Department funded tour, uh, primarily because it involved the Soviet Union. Um, the New York Philharmonic were one of the first ensembles who were um, permitted to uh, tour in the Soviet Union. This came about as a result of an exchange agreement that was made between the United States and the Soviet Union, which allowed the two countries to send cultural attractions to the other. This happened for just a period of a few brief years at the end of the 1950s, when there was somewhat of a, a thaw in relations. Um, so this, uh, this New York Philharmon Philharmonic tour, um, Bernstein, of course, Leonard Bernstein, the famous uh, TV star, composer, conductor. He was the director of the orchestra at this time, and uh, you'll see him in these pictures. He, um, Bernstein was a, um, a strongly politically active and uh, verbal character. Um, he had lots to say about music and politics. Um, and this, I think, also makes this tour particularly intriguing. He stirred up a lot of trouble for the US government while on this tour. Um, the picture you see at the bottom there is him in a meeting with Boris Pasternak, the famous author, who had recently been censored by the Soviet, Soviet government. Bernstein insisted upon meeting him. Pasternak also came to one of their concerts. This caused a great hoo-ha amongst the Soviet authorities, as I'm sure you can imagine. Bernstein also was very vocal as he always was at concerts in talking about the music during the concerts and he wasn't afraid to um, speak about uh, how American music expressed American values in these concerts and this too was somewhat problematic for Soviet authorities. I'm going to show you a little video of uh, what I think is a particularly <laughs> iconic moment from this tour and indeed in Cold War musical diplomacy in general. This is a TV show that was made during this tour, um, the show involved um, Bernstein doing his usual thing. Uh, those of you who, who are familiar with the Young People's Concerts will know that he really made himself famous um, uh, in TV shows that involved him uh, speaking to his audience about the music and then performing the music with the Philharmonic. Um, and this is exactly what he does in this TV show. Now this show was um, produced in front of a Soviet audience. So it's actually a recording of a, a concert for a Soviet audience. However, the show was recorded for broadcast in the United States. So this kind of gives us an idea of how already in the late 50s, media is providing a very important vehicle for sort of changing the terms of the, uh, of the Cold War. Um, what we see in this show, as you'll see in a moment, is um, Bernstein um, showing us that um, he really, well, he's really demonstrating his belief in the power of music as a tool to bring about political change. Um, he really believed that, um, that music could build bridges, could help people to better understand each other. He was really the idealist that um, Eisenhower was speaking to in his public pronouncements. And what he does in the TV show, and I can only show a tiny clip of it, but what he does after this introduction is um, he compares two pieces of music uh, which are going to be performed in the concert. He compares um, Aaron Copeland's Billy the Kid, a quintessentially American work, with Dmitry Shostakovich's Symphony No. 7. Um, and he shows how these two pieces um, are infused with many of the same ideas. Um, he shows, therefore, that American music and Russian music are essentially just the same, and thus that Americans and Russians are really at heart just the same. Um, so it's this wonderful, idealistic um, presentation. I'll just show you a little bit of it now. Yes, we two countries have come a long way toward being close together. But we must come even closer together not only because we two giant nations cannot afford to be unfriendly, but also because it is so natural a thing for us to be close to each other. Despite all our obvious differences, the 
vast differences of language, of customs, of social and economic systems, despite all these, we have likenesses which are even more basic than our differences, and which I believe will, in the long run, prevail. Now, what is this closeness based on? What is it that makes us so alike in spite of the obvious differences? Well, we're going to try to answer that question today, at least in part, through music. Perhaps music can tell us some surprising things that we can't find out from books and newspapers. The first thing of all to be said is that Americans and Russians simply love each other's music. Each people seems to find something of itself in the music of the other. Somehow we sense a common identity on the deepest level in that special corner of the heart where music lives and breathes. Just remember how you Russians loved Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. The Pomnite etu prikrasnyu melodiu of the Porgy and Bess. There is something in this Gershwin music of, of a tragic beauty, of an unashamed emotional candor that is as typically Russian as it is American. So a very brave and bold political mission on Bernstein's part here. Nevertheless, the Cold War was bigger than even Leonard Bernstein, <laughs> and uh, he couldn't win it on his own. Um, unfortunately, Copeland had a, a Copeland, Bernstein had a, a grand plan here. Um, unusually for him, he wrote out the full script that he was intending to speak, something he didn't usually do word for word, and he had it translated into Russian, and he asked that um, everyone in the audience be given a program book with the translation of his speech. Mysteriously, the program books never showed up. <laughs> he then asked, when they hadn't shown up on the day, he said, would it be possible for a translator to translate my speech as I, as I go along, or at least some part of it? Because, I mean, the whole show is like this, right? <laughs> it's kind of, you need to know what he's saying. Um, and yet they said yes, and again, that person did not materialize. So in the end, all that happened was at the very beginning of the show, uh, someone got up and said something brief about what, what he was going to be doing on the stage. Um, but, you know, Bernstein, as you see, he spoke, he spoke a little rudimentary Russian, but there was no way he could give this whole, this whole speech in Russian. Uh, and, of course, it was going to be broadcast on American television, so he couldn't have spoken the whole thing in Russian anyway. So he ended up giving this whole great show about the unity between the Russian and the American people to an audience, most of whom would not have understood him. So I think this is kind of uh, symptomatic of the, you know, missing each other <laughs> that's, that's going on here. Okay, let's move on to another um, case study from the State Department tours. Um, this, um, this tour is, uh, this figure is particularly well known as a Cold War musical ambassador, uh, the, uh, the jazz musician Louis Armstrong. What, what Louis Armstrong helps us to, to dig into is the intersection between the Cold War and the civil rights movement. These two play into each other in a host of very interesting ways that have been explored by scholars. Now, Louis Armstrong himself was acutely aware of the irony inherent in a black musician representing an America that was still segregated. So speaking on behalf of a country, uh, promoting a country where his people were not considered equal. Um, he was, uh, however, recognized uh, by the State Department as being potentially a very useful um, ambassador for his country, and he was approved for a State Department funded tour in 1955. A year later, as it happened, he was invited um, to the, um, the British Gold Coast colony, which later became Ghana. This tour, however, wasn't at any initiative of the State Department. It was funded by Edward R. Murrow, the TV personality who wants to make a film about him. But the tour was hugely successful, and this really encouraged the State Department to say, gosh, we really need to get this guy for one of our tours. And so they started trying to arrange a tour of him in the USSR. They wanted to have to do what they later would do with Bernstein. Um, 
Of course, um, a jazz tour in the Soviet Union would have been very potent because at that time uh, jazz was essentially banned in the Soviet Union. So if they had managed to um, to get Louis Armstrong into the Soviet Union, it would have had an amazing political impact. Actually, as it turned out, they wouldn't have been able to do that anyway. But in the, because the Soviet Union were not okay about that, because they knew how potent it would be. But in the interim, a crisis happened that brought all discussion to an end. And that was the crisis at Little Rock. Um, and of course, this, the, the crisis at Little Rock was really a major event, of course, in the, the civil rights movement. This, of course, is um, the moment when um, nine black school students who were supposed to be attending a previously white high school for the first time not since its integration, uh, these students were prevented from entering their high school by um, their state's governor. Eisenhower himself had to intervene, although he didn't much want to, and he had to send the army down to um, force the integration of the school. There was a terrible standoff between the, the state police and the, the army, and the whole thing was just an awful mess. And it really showed to the world what a terrible mess American civil rights was in. Armstrong, like many African Americans, was absolutely disgusted by what was happening um, in Little Rock, and uh, he responded extremely badly to, to the situation. Here's a newspaper clipping from the New York Times at that time, and you'll see up in the top paragraph he says that he'd given up plans for a government-sponsored trip to the Soviet Union because the way they are treating my people in the South, the government can go to hell. <laughs> He said that down at the bottom of that um, column, he says, it's getting almost so bad a colored man hasn't got any country. So he was uh, pretty disgusted by the whole thing and said there was absolutely no way he was going to tour for the State Department under these, while the, the government was sanctioning such things. Nevertheless, he did change his mind. And three years later, um, he agreed to a tour of 27 cities in Africa. Um, here's some pictures from that tour. As you can see, he was a huge, huge hit in Africa. But nevertheless, the racial politics of the tour hadn't simply gone away by Armstrong agreeing to, to go on tour. He himself remained ambivalent about working for the State Department. He believed, however, though, that the um, the, the benefits of the tour for, for jazz, for his reputation, um, for black music in general, were ultimately outweighed the, <clears throat> the, the personal issues he had with working um, for a government under a still somewhat segregated um, political system. Um, for the State Department, though, this was a coup, as, as were all their tours of um, African-American musicians. Um, these tours helped them respond to widespread press coverage across the world of American racism and of the horrific incidents that were occurring during the civil rights protests. They helped them to demonstrate that it was possible in the United States for a black man to succeed. And they helped and he helped demonstrate um, that the United States was proud of its African Americans, that they wanted to promote them overseas. So this, this sends a very positive um, political message, which, which, which it was hoped would counteract the terrible scenes of, of beatings and dogs being cast onto protesters that most foreigners were seeing on their TV screens. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty disturbing um, confluence of, uh, of problems. Of course, these, the, the negative images of the civil rights movement were also having a major impact on America's waging of the Cold War. They were very troubled that people were turning against the United States because of what they saw happening um, uh, there to the African Americans. Um, so this, this made it all the more urgent to uh, dispel these ideas. Um, I've just got a little video here of a uh, news little news footage of uh, Armstrong in Africa. One of America's most popular emissaries gets a warm reception as he arrives in the troubled Congo on a State Department-sponsored goodwill mission. Louis Sancho Armstrong, whose golden trumpet has preached the gospel of New Orleans, jazz of every continent, arrives in truly royal style. Radio Mom. 
Moscow, which blasted Armstrong's visit as a diversionary tactic, a left-handed tribute to a mellow cat the Congolese find right on the beam. Kind of fun. Okay, so let's move on. So, next I want to introduce you to this organization, the Congress for Cultural Freedom. This was a European cultural organization founded in 1950 in West Berlin, and it had a very clearly articulated goal. Its goal was to counter the view that liberal democracy was less compatible with high culture, less able to create works of high culture than communism. Increasingly, as I mentioned before, there was this feeling that, um, that communism was much, the communist system as it was used, as it was applied in the Soviet Union, was much better set up for, um, for bringing about great works of art because musicians were funded, um, the whole system made it easier to be a composer, was the idea. And so there were many um, artists and intellectuals in Europe who had traditionally leaned to the left who were beginning to think, gosh, this is kind of seems like a good idea. We should get that. <laughs> and the Americans obviously were kind of worried about this. So this organization, <coughs> excuse me, this ostensibly private organization set up to, to address this problem. And um, the way they did it was to um, uh, organize music festivals and conferences um, of intellectuals and artists and musicians um, and demonstrate to them, these European intellectuals, uh, that um, a whole diversity of cultural outcomes were, were possible under democratic capitalism. So what that meant is, um, they performed a whole array of musical works, typically musical works that they presumed that um, Europeans would uh, appreciate and find value in, especially these, these intellectuals who they believed were hugely socially in influential. And in Europe at that time, they were. Um, they knew that if they could keep the intellectuals on side, there would be more chance of them keeping the rest of the population on side. So they wanted to, um, to demonstrate to them and remind them, really, I mean, they knew it, but remind them um, that capitalism really, ultimately, was a far better um, system for enabling the creation of great works of art than was communism. So, and part of this was, was showing, um, drawing attention, really, to the fact that the, the Soviets, um, while they indeed did have mechanisms to support composers, they also had very strict rules about the kind of music that composers could write. Um, so composers um, were not simply given money and then told they could go off and do whatever they wanted. Uh, they were expected to write um, nationalistic pieces of music that in some way demonstrated the Russian spirit, that were written in an approachable musical language that everyone could love and understand. They weren't allowed to write anything that was difficult or uh, written in the, the new 12-tone language that was becoming so popular in the West at the time. Of course, the Congress for Cultural Freedom was able to demonstrate that in the West, no such restrictions applied. And this was one of the wonderful things about artistic creation in the West in their, um, in their presentation. So they performed works by um, many of the more um, cutting edge modernist composers of the 20th century, people like Arnold Schoenberg, who famously invented the 12 tone method, and uh, Igor Stravinsky, and they used these pieces to demonstrate that in the West it was still okay to write really difficult music. And even if we might not all love it and appreciate it, the main thing was is that we didn't ban it, <laughs> right? We let it happen and we encouraged it because we knew that this is what was going to lead to artistic progress, not government top-down control. At the same time as they played these, um, these very cutting-edge pieces, they also um, compared and contrasted them with more approachable works of art by, by composers like Aaron Copland um, to, to demonstrate that a whole range of artistic outcomes were possible under this political system. Now, these, the Congress for Cultural Freedom had a lot of success in the 50s and 60s with these conferences and uh, festivals which were held across Europe and Asia. 
Um, but all this came to a very sudden end in 1967. And that was the year in which this magazine, Ramparts, um, exposed the remarkable <laughs> and comprehensive um, CIA involvement in a host of um, anti-communist organizations um, across the United States and Europe. Um, you can see just up in the, you probably can't see, I can barely see it, but up in the top left-hand corner there it says, an expose, the CIA. Um, <laughs> and it revealed that the Congress for Cultural Freedom, this um, apparently private organization, um, was actually um, receiving money through a host of dummy foundations, which were set up simply to fuel money from the CIA. So they had the impression of having funders from all these different um, lovely, generous uh, foundations. In fact, those foundations, you know, they, they only existed um, to, uh, to fuel this money. Um, the CIA, nevertheless, still maintains to this day that this operation, despite its discovery, was a huge success. And I think this is kind of an interesting quote from their website. The Congress for Cultural Freedom is widely considered one of the CIA's more daring and effective Cold War covert operations. Doesn't say much <laughs> covert, well, I don't know. <laughs> it's pretty interesting that they, that they believe that this organization that simply organized conferences of intellectuals and concerts, that this is one of the most effective things that the CIA did in the Cold War. It's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, it's also remarkable to me today, I think, to, to imagine a world in which um, music was considered um, capable of changing global opinion to such an extent that it was worth um, hiding its funding through these, these dummy organizations, that it was considered so essential to, to bring money to an organization like this, that the CIA would set up such a complex um, system of funding to make that possible. Um, really kind of a remarkable outcome of the cultural Cold War. So finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about the US Information Agency. As I said before, this is essentially a propaganda agency. Many Americans don't like it when I say that, um, because supposedly the United States doesn't create propaganda. Um, <laughs> But uh, I'm glad you were all cynical about that too. <laughs> but um, very clearly this organization, and it's clear in all the documents, this organization was set up in response to the Soviets' huge propaganda machine, and which was extremely effective and which was having massive results across the world um, in the late 40s and early 50s. There was simply no other option, the US government believed in the early 50s, but to respond to this propaganda machine with a propaganda machine of their own. However, the Americans' propaganda machine would, of course, be about truth. This was the, the goal. We, we, will, we will show everyone what's really going on, and hopefully it will also um, put us in a good light. <laughs> um, a lot of people describe what, what the USAA were doing as grey propaganda. So it's, it's not the worst kind but it's also, it's still propaganda. <laughs> um, so they, they, they report the news um, on their radio station, The Voice of America, for example, but it, it, it was meant, at this time especially, it was meant to, you know, just tweak it a little bit so that we don't look too bad in all of this. So anyway, this organization set up in 1953 to, with the goal, they said, of distributing information to foreigners about the United States and its way of life. Again, with the same idea of these other programs that if people better understood the United States, uh, they might be more willing to embrace its way of life. Now, the, the agency created a whole host of different sort of media to promote their message. Um, they made um, uh, pamphlets. Um, they made big displays about all different aspects of American life. Um, they um, had libraries and they made documentaries. And all of these uh, were distributed or presented through American embassies across the world. And of that's um, uh, one of the famous America House in Germany, um, which was one venue, um, a particularly well-known uh, venue for these such activities. Um, 
So in these, um, in these embassies, um, as a foreigner, you could go in and uh, sit in their libraries and um, learn everything you could want to know about America. You could read American novels, you could watch American documentaries and movies, you could listen to LPs of American music, um, you could fully absorb <laughs> everything you might want to absorb um, related to the United States. Uh, the USAA had a music department, and that music department was responsible for selecting the appropriate LPs to send um, to the embassies. Um, they also um, made um, documentaries um, about American music and American composers. Um, and I just wanted to, before I, I'm actually going to play you a little bit of one of those documentaries, but before I do that I thought I would read you this quote. Uh, the USA's description of what music is capable of, and it sort of echoes a lot of the other ideas we've seen this evening. Non-controversial and non-propagandistic, music will often make friends, open doors, influence opinion where other programs and other approaches may fail. The sound of American music does more than create a mood. It carries overseas a message that reflects America. Now this is an idea I want you to think about as we watch this next film. Um, this idea that, well, two things, there's two parts released to this idea. Firstly, that music opens people's minds so that then we can put our information in there. And a lot of um, uh, cultural attaches that I've spoken to who've worked, who worked in American embassies have said that, um, uh, that one of the best things about concerts was that you could take you know, your Soviet officials to these concerts and then you could actually the concert kind of provided a way that then you could talk to them on a more human level. It broke down the social barriers. So that's sort of one aspect of it, I think. Um, but it's also this idea, too, in the second paragraph there, that American music can actually reflect America. The USAA believed this. Um, and I think this is really key to this little clip I'm going to show you um, next. How am I doing? Okay, all right. Um, so this is a documentary about the American composer Aaron Copeland. Um, and Copeland became very well known um, during the 50s and 60s and 70s as an American composer across the world, um, but his biography was not without problematic aspects. So Copeland um, had actually been a victim of Senator Joseph McCarthy in the early 1950s. He'd been hauled before McCarthy, accused of being a communist sympathizer. And indeed, McCarthy wasn't totally off base. Copeland had been interested, um, at least to some extent, in, co in communism during the 30s, as indeed many um, intellectuals were during that period. Um, he was also a homosexual, which of course in the 50s and 60s was a difficult thing to be. <laughs> um, in this film though, as you'll see, this film which is made by the USAA, a documentary about Copeland, his character and his music are very carefully, I think, repackaged, rebranded, to be presented internationally in such a way that America is presented in the best possible light. This famous composer and his famous music are branded as um, quintessentially American in such a way that America is uh, reflected well. Part of that, um, in a section of the film that you won't see here, you just have to take my word for it, um, earlier in the film when they describe his biography, um, Copeland is depicted, I think, in line with a kind of American dream narrative. His, his uh, childhood is, is somehow seen to be terribly impoverished, although he was actually the, store of a, the, the son of a department store owner, so he was hardly impoverished. Um, but that enables the filmmakers to, to create this kind of, you know, boy who comes from nothing, this American nobody who grows up to become the, one of the most famous composers in the world. Um, so that's sort of part of it. And then I think, too, what, what you see in the scene I'm going to show you is um, American music, um, no, Copeland's music um, being very distinctly and um, overtly associated with the United States itself, with American landscapes, with, yeah, the whole, the whole of American geography is somehow seen to be expressed within Copeland's music. Um, and I think that thanks to promotions like this one that you're about to see, Copeland was able to rebrand himself. Copeland was able to resurrect his image after the difficulties of McCarthy. Um, and bring himself to the position that his reputation is in today, um, which is as a composer of quintessentially American music, 
um, quasi-nationalist, almost right-wing. He moved, he's moved in our political image from this, you know, crazy communist to, you know, hardcore Republican somehow in, in the American eyes. And I think that it's, it's films like this that play a role in that. And you'll see too in the film that Copeland himself plays a role in this rebranding of his image. Copeland is actually speaking in the voiceover here, and he's describing how his music tries to express America. So he too is helping the US Information Agency to rebrand himself, because this ultimately is, in his own ben is to his own uh, benefit as well. Okay, I'll stop talking about it and you can... preoccupied with the idea of trying to write a music which would be recognizably American in the sense that America has its own kind of civilization, its own feelings about life, and that we hadn't really developed composers of general significance who were able to reflect that kind of feeling and that kind of life. This film seems very clearly to show that, that goal of the USIA's music program that I, I showed you before, this idea that somehow American music expresses America. And we're being encouraged very deliberately, I think, here to interpret his music in that way. So those are all the examples I, I have to show you today. But I hope that um, you've got a sense of the diverse ways that the government, the US government became involved um, with music during the Cold War. Um, I think it, this, these stories leave us more questions than um, answers. Um, does music really have the power to change political opinions, as Eisenhower seems to have believed it, it might do? Does it have the ability to express in sound what a nation really stands for? Can music really do that? And perhaps the big question here, did music play a role in ending the Cold War? Something to think about. <laughs> Certainly there's no, there's no clear answers to these questions, but I, think that, I hope that these examples have given us um, a way to uh, begin to explore them. Thanks. <laughs>